Records and Information Security Administration Notice. The O5 Council has approved for the SCP-6101 designation to be reserved for the exclusive use of the Department of Public Relations to aid in post fail operations. Item number SCP-6101 Security Level 6 Containment Class Esoteric Secondary Class Thaumiel Disruption Class Aki Risk Class Danger Special Containment Procedures SCP-6101 is too powerful to contain. He has to be left in the care of his family until the next time the Foundation should call upon him for assistance. Description SCP-6101 is the most powerful SCP. His name is Ethan Prosper. He is nine years old at the time of writing. The full extent of SCP-6101's powers are unknown, but he has displayed capabilities such as flight, super strength, invisibility, and all the powers of the Marvel superheroes. He is anonymously brave and capable of doing anything he sets his mind to. SCP-6101 has two guns which he carries with him at all times. The guns which he has named Fear and Loathing shoot bullets made of pure light and darkness, respectively. His dog Heidi, sub-designated SCP-6101, is the second most powerful SCP. She is fiercely loyal to SCP-6101 and protects him from anomalous organizations who want to use his powers for themselves. Incident Law On May 18th, 2028, SCP Omega broke out of its cell in Site 301. Unable to re-establish containment of the anomaly, Site Director Rushpa Chagavati called upon SCP-6101 for assistance. SCP-6101 was then personally escorted to Site 301 by Mobile Task Force Psi-301. Genie in a bottle from his room at St. Jude's Children Research Hospital. Using a combination of telekinetic abilities and verbal threats, SCP-6101 successfully drove SCP Omega back into its containment cell as witnesses applauded and cheered. He was awarded a Foundation Star for his efforts by Director Chakravati in the special ceremony shortly afterwards. In addition to saving the lives of everyone at Site 301, SCP-6101 became a hero to countless other critically ill children like himself after reports of his bravery on local news stations led to a surge in donations to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Item Number SCP-6963 Object Class Archon Site Responsible, Site 90, Director, Toda Moose, Research Head, Dr. Jack Bright, Assigned Task Force, Not Applicable, Security Level 3, Special Containment Procedures, Due to post fail Circumstances and the Relative Harmlessness of SCP-6963, No Protocols have been enacted to confine those affected by the anomaly. Subjects of SCP-6963 treat the targeted individual as fictional and as such should be publicly considered so in order to bring little suspicion to the person in question. Research into the cause behind SCP-6963's creation to possibly methodize a way to reverse its effects is currently ongoing. Note. Dr. Bright's request to be reassigned to a separate anomaly has been denied for the time being. Description SCP-6963 denotes an abnormal phenomenon surrounding Dr. Jack Bright. The criteria in which one is affected remains unclear. To date, an estimate of approximately 250,000 individuals worldwide have been subjected to the anomaly's effects, and amnestization has proven to be ineffective. However, those influenced by SCP-963 are wholly convinced that Dr. Bright is merely a fictional character, despite a lack of evidence regarding the persona's creator. 
Subjects affected by SCP-6963 displayed intense feelings of affection towards Dr. Bright, oftentimes showing their appreciation for him via methods most appropriate to them. Examples of SCP-6963 related activities include, but are not limited to, drawing pieces of art depicting Dr. Bright in some fashion, producing music pertaining to Dr. Bright in some way, writing fiction featuring Dr. Bright as the main protagonist, creating merchandise of Dr. Bright, the perpetrator responsible for SCP-6963's existence, if applicable, is unknown. Addendum 1. Instance Log The following are examples of media pertaining to Dr. Bright as a result of SCP-6963 used for the sake of briefing associated personnel. More excerpts are available upon request. Excerpt from Wattpad Dr. Bright Pendued against the wall with a smirk on his face, the red amulet around his neck shimmering under the blazing fluorescent light. He blushed heavily, confused of what he was doing. Right, Emma, you blurted. What, you know, like? The researcher's head under his breath. We can't do this. It is unprofessional. Right paused before bursting into laughing, confusing you even more now. I don't care. Hell no, I would just get away with it like every other time. You have nothing to worry about. Your eyes widened. They didn't know Bright felt that way about him. He looked away in embarrassment. Both doctors' heart beat heartily before the two. Excerpt from Tumblr Ask Dr. Bright anything. Hello, I am Dr. Bright. Not actually, this is Roleplay. Also, this pig is not me, and I work for a foundation. Ask me any questions, and I will answer you. If you are a troller, or if you do not like Dr. Bright, then please leave. Let people love what they love, haters. Don't like, don't read. What is it like working for the foundation? Is it fun? It is very fun indeed. There are so many crazy anomalies. Loads of Bessie to talk to, and overall, it can get a lot interesting. I'm just happy being here. Can you teach me about SCPs? Also, I love your work. Also, I love your roleplay. Of course, as I am the smartest doctor in all Foundation, there's a lot of creepy monsters, killer items, and basically a lot of spookiness. Ooh. But my favorite SCP of them all, personally, is Siren Head. It is a very amazing skip. You should check it out. How's it being immortal? The other doctors are just jealous, because I can live longer than them. Get back, haters! Anyway, I want to be Dr. Fred and Morty, if you know what I mean. Can I get a hug, right? Here you go. No offense, I know this is a roleplay... Well, uh, this doesn't seem like Dr. Bright. He's a scientist. He works for the Foundation. I doubt he'd be making so many grammatical mistakes and answering useless questions. Again, I'm not saying you shouldn't continue doing this, but you might need to at least proofread your answers before posting. Sorry if this comes off as harsh. Just uh, giving some critique. You're just bad because Dr. Bright would never remotely even dare to stare at you. Because people like you are so rude and toxic. Come in here thinking that you know how Bright acts and talks. You just hate it. You just a hater. And nobody cares. You call it critique. But I know that's just an excuse. I know you're just saying that so you can attack me. Stop lying and admit it. Honestly, very disappointed right now. Like I said, if you don't like it, don't read it. You haters are so blind, you know. I can't believe people like you even exist. Like, up over already, brah. Do us a favor and leave this goddamn website. Like, come on. TLDR. Nobody ask. <laughs> yeah, hater, shut up. What do you know about right, huh? Report it. Fake fan, fake fan. Note, the commenter above had deleted her account following this thread. 
excerpt from YouTube, titled My Everlasting Love for Dr. Bright, created by Bright Lover 246 Duration, 31 minutes, 27 seconds. Begin log. Which begins in the background. There is a shrine to the right, and a suspended red amulet hanging on the left. So the user sets down the camera before stepping back and silently grinning. They take out a handmade plushie, presumably of Dr. Bright, before furiously embracing it, and burying her head into it. They raised her head, her eyes widened and unblinking. The person inhales deeply. Oh, Bright Summer, if it's for you, I'd do anything. I would kill hundreds, nay thousands of people if you desired it. You are the pinnacle of beauty, if not the definition. I am in your debt, Doctor. I love every single moment I spend with thee. They suddenly hyperventilate, gripping tighter onto the toy. Please don't ever leave me. I can't live without your presence. Be mine, nobody else. I can't let you be with anyone else. I will stab everyone who tries to get in our way, our relationship. They think I'm crazy, but you don't, right? You would never say such a thing. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> it's them add on saying, thinking that we don't deserve to be together. Th that they said you weren't real, but we'll show them, Bright Summer. We'll show all of them. I just know I'll be safe, cause I'm next to you. Honey, dinner's ready! <sighs> Shut up, Mom! I'm recording something! End log. Addendum 2. Interview. Personnel interviewed. Dr. Jack Bright, Site 19. Director Tilda D. Moose, Site 19. Subject, SCP-6963. Begin log, 2254. Moose enters the interview room, holding onto a clipboard. Bright is already seated, tapping his foot, and notices Moose as she pulls back the chair and sit down. Both are silent for a brief moment. You had something you wanted to discuss with me, Bright. Bright nods. Mm hmm. It's. It's about 1693. You see, I was wondering if. Moose crosses his arms. If you're requesting to be transferred, then I'm going to refuse your offer. How come? It's practically harmless, Bright. I'm sure you've been through worse. Moose. When I first worked for the Foundation, I did not expect I developed a fan base overnight. I did not ask for this, I did not sign up for this, and I surely didn't spend over a century to suddenly have people craving my very presence. But you did agree to research anomalies, and that includes your followers. What part of this would you consider as research? We're merely observing a crowd of people violently thrashing at each other's necks over a door that's apparently supposed to look like me, when it couldn't be farther from how I actually look. How do you think celebrities feel? Look, my point is, why can't you accept my request? Right, you have your reasons, and I know what you're going through is certainly an uncomfortable experience for most, but... It's not as simple as we assigning you. You'd still be exposed to all the fictions revolving around you and their indiscernible imagination. It's basically fruitless. Bright drugs and avert his gaze. And unless we can find a way to fix this mess, you're just going to have to deal with it. I'm sorry, but I don't know what you expect me to do. <sighs> I know, I know. But still, it's exhausting. I didn't want this. Cheer up, right? At least you're not aware you exist. I doubt that makes the situation any better. But thank you, I guess. My pleasure. Just don't stress yourself too much. If you ever wanted to take five, all you have to do is tell me. I don't mind giving you a break from all the work. 
Sure, I'll keep that in mind. Moose checks her watch before standing from the seat. Anyways, I'll be heading off now. I have other duties to attend to. Actually, there's something else I wanted to say before I leave, right? Hmm? Do me a favor and keep yourself together, alright? Moose exits the room. Right. End log. 2259. Update! A recent spike in SCP-6963 activity has been reported. Cost believed to be an announcement. Cost believed to be an announcement made on an online web forum known as Brightnet. Action to mitigate the spread of SCP-6963 is currently underway, though no progress has been observed thus far. The aforementioned post has been transcribed below for reference. Announcement by Mr. Silver, Maud. Good day, afternoon, evening to everyone in the bright community. We hope that every single one of you are doing your best. As you can tell by the post title, this is an announcement from the Mod team. And oh boy, this is a big one indeed. Of course, this is about our beloved character, Dr. Bright. To put it simply, we'll be opening up a new section, open to anybody to contribute. Obviously, we'll be looking over any additions made to this little experiment for any hate directed towards our precious child. Damn haters! And you may be asking, what is this? What are you doing? Well, we all know that our researcher here is professional, like your typical top-notch scientist. People like him tend to be confused as a robot, forgetting that there are people too, and people like Bright make mistakes. This new page will be dedicated to all the mishaps he's made throughout his mischievous life working at the Foundation. This is to show that Bright isn't just some cold, soulless monster, but an actual person with actual feelings. And to make it even more intriguing, it will be in the form of a list, a list of rules telling him what not to do. Feel free to add on to the record of things Bright is not allowed to do at the Foundation. This post has been made by a member of the staff team. If you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to ask us. Item number SCP-6041 Object Class Safe Update Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-6041 is to be contained within an anomalous vehicle containment bay in Site-43 when not in use. Personnel entering SCP-6041-1 from interacting with the environment whenever possible unless partaking in testing. Update. Testing with SCP-6041 has been suspended until further notice. Current objectives are to prevent and mitigate the growth of SCP-6041-A. Description. SCP-6041 is an object resembling an industrial scissor lift. At a distance, SCP-6041 appears to be made of standard materials compared to non-anomalous models. However, if a sentient being moves in close proximity or maintaining eye contact with SCP-6041, the object is perceived to be made of various types of anomalously durable paper, primarily cardboard, newspaper, and multicolored confetti. SCP-6041's main anomalous property becomes active when it is operated. Note, SCP-6041 does not require electricity or gasoline to function. And extended beyond 12 meters, additional scissor arms will emerge from the chassis, allowing SCP-6041 to ascend further. There is currently no known limit to this extension. All manifested scissor arms will sink and demanifest into the chassis upon descent. If one or more sentient beings are inside the confines of the platform as SCP-6041 ascends beyond 12 meters, subjects will report that their surroundings have drastically changed. These changes can be witnessed in person and by photography or videography. 
Examples of changes include buildings and bridges are replaced by cardboard replicas and popsicle sticks respectively. All buildings have windows and doors drawn onto them in crayon. All metallic objects are wrapped in thick sheets of tinfoil. All bodies of water that appear are represented by pieces of blue paper, with the ocean appearing as multiple blue wool blankets overlapping each other. All earthly terrain appear to be composed of modern clay, with the colour of the clay matching the composition of the area. All humans, animals, anomalous entities, vehicles, and inanimate objects are depicted as plastic models constructed from ceramic material. These models are the exact size of their real-life counterparts. All models, with the exception of inanimate objects, are fixed to stands. The positions and posture of these models change constantly when not directly observed. All airborne entities and objects are suspended by thin strands of string. The length of the string is undetermined as it appears to extend indefinitely towards the sky. These changes are reversed upon complete descent. If a subject descends without operating SCP-6041, jumping off the platform, climbing down the scissor arms, crossing over to another high-rise object, etc. The changes will remain, and outside observers will witness subjects spontaneously disappearing. Subjects are capable of traversing this environment by foot while maintaining their endurance indefinitely. Subjects will only exit the environment by re-entering the platform and descending with SCP-6041. Discovery SCP-6041 was recovered from San Juan Capistrano, California, in the aftermath of a minor car collision which resulted in the damage of five separate vehicles. The owner of the car who caused the collision was in the middle of explaining why he was not to blame to another individual involved in the crash before strong winds removed the top of the car hauler attached to his vehicle, revealing SCP-6041. After SCP-6041's perception-shifting properties became apparent to nearby civilians, the driver fled the area. Notes recovered from the vehicle claimed that the owner, Michael Ferry, designated POI-4857, was an avid fan of GOI-267, or Recuriate. POI-4857 stated that he found SCP-6041 by accident within the premises of an abandoned paper mill and had been attempting to bring the anomalous object back to his residence in hopes of integrating himself further into the an artist community. All witnesses were amnesticized and SCP-6041 was transported to Site-43 without incident. A search priority was issued for POI 4857, but no further sightings have been reported since. Addendum 1 Testing Shortly after containment, it became apparent that the visual changes experienced by subjects were in actuality SCP-6041 crossing over to a dimension parallel to our own. It was also revealed that any physical interaction in this dimension, hereby referred to as SCP-6041-1, will directly correspond to our own. SCP-6041-1 can be affected through physical interaction in our own dimension as well, albeit to a limited degree. A series of tests were commenced under lead researcher Jennings, to test the limits of SCP-6041-1. Materials required 1 water hose, 1 wooden pole, 1.5 meters. JM, Janitorial and Maintenance Staff, 498, JM390. Test parameters, the hose will be used to create a large puddle on the ground. JM498 and JM390 are to operate SCP-6041 and enter SCP-6041-1. JM-498 is tasked with walking across the puddle. JM-390 is tasked with crawling under the puddle with use of the pole. Result! JM-490 walks across 
and immediately sinks into the puddle. JM-498 flounces around for 17 seconds before swimming in the other side. Physically exhausted, JM-390 reluctantly approaches the puddle. JM-390 uses the pole to lift up a small section of the puddle to his surprise. JM-390 adjusts the pole upright and crawls underneath the puddle without difficulty. JM-390 comments that the experience was enjoyable due to the annoyance of JM-498. Note, all bodies of water in SCP-6041-1 universally possess a greater depth than our dimension's counterparts. Observers outside of SCP-6041-1 notice a section of the puddle hovering above the ground, following an unidentified mass traveling under the water before dissipating. Materials Required SCP-6041, JM-498, JM-390 One Hedge Tremor, One Bowling Ball Test Parameters Testing is to commence far away from major population centers. JM-498 and JM-390 are to be provided with the hedge tremor and the bowling ball. They are to operate SCP-6041, enter SCP-6041-1, and ascend high into the troposphere. Note, subjects are not hindered by oxygen deprivation whilst in SCP-6041-1. They are to approach one of the clouds and sever the string, after which they are to tie the end of the string to the bowling ball. Result, SCP-6041 is positioned under a small cloud. JM-498 and JM-390 ascend and enter SCP-6041-1 as instructed. JM-498 initially approaches the string with the hedge tremors, but suddenly presses them into JM-390's hand, citing that he has a better reach than him. Note, it should be noted that JM-498 was clinically diagnosed with acrophobia before being recruited as janitorial and maintenance technician. JM-390 sighs and approaches the cloud and cuts the string without difficulty. The cloud slowly floats to the ground. JM-390 grabs the string and ties it around the bowling ball. Once confident it won't slip from the string, both personnel descend and exit SCP-6041-1. Notes: The cloud we covered was found to be tangible to solid matter and displays properties consistent with con. The bowling ball was found to be suspended in mid-air. Once removed from the string, the bowling ball's anomalous properties ceased. Attempts to reattach the cloud to the string failed. The cloud was designated an anomalous object and placed in storage. Materials required JM-498 JM-390 One shovel One steel block One knife Various types of colored clay Test parameters The steel cable is to be placed near SCP-6041. JM-498 and JM-390 are to operate SCP-6041 and enter SCP-6041-1. JM-498 and JM-390 are provided the shovel and clay, and the knife respectively. JM-498 is tasked with digging out a section of the floor and replacing it with the clay. JM-390 is tasked with removing the tinfoil from the cube. Result. JM-498 and JM-390 operated SCP-6041 and entered SCP-6041-1. JM-390 removed the tinfoil with the knife, revealing a smaller cube constructed of cardboard underneath. JM-498 dug several holes and filled them with clay colored yellow, white, and green. Upon exiting SCP-6041-1, it was found that the metal shavings and the cube as transmuted into tin foil and cardboard respectively. The holes they were dug up have been filled with sand, snow, and grass. Note, SCP-6041-1 has the potential to transmute matter in our dimension of certain measures were taken. Materials Required JM-498, JM-390, one instance of 
says Domescus, domestic pig. Test parameters. The pig is to be released near SCP-6041 with leftovers from the cafeteria used to keep it stationary. JM-498 and JM-390 are to operate SCP-6041 and enter SCP-6041-1. They are then tasked to move the pig around various spots near SCP-6041. Result. JM-498 and JM-390 approached and removed the model. Outside observations showed the pig levitating off the ground and moving in the same direction as JM-498 and JM-390. Midway through the test, JM-498 accidentally lost its grip on the model, allowing it to shatter on the ground. The pig suddenly stopped in mid-air before impacting the ground, shattering in the same manner. Despite its injuries, the pig neither expired nor bled out. The pig was returned to normal after rearranging the broken pieces back in place and gluing them together. Note, the models are more fragile compared to non-anomalous counterparts. Extra precautions are now to be used when interacting with objects in SCP-6041-1. Materials required SCP-6041, JM-498, JM-390 Test Parameters JM-498 and JM-390 are to operate SCP-6041 and enter SCP-6041-1. They are to ascend as high as possible to test the spatial regions of SCP-6041-1. Result, see Addendum 2. Addendum 2 Incident 6041-1. Following extensive testing, SCP-6041 received the attention of Site-43's arms and equipment section due to the nature of its anomalous properties. It was suggested that SCP-6041 could be used not only for reconnaissance, but also as a tool for combating dangerous anomalies without undue risk. As a result, SCP-6041 was considered for reclassification to Thamiel class. Before further discussion on the subject of SCP-6041 could be scheduled, Section Chair Dr. T. Promo authorized a final test. The purpose of this test was to confirm if there was an equivalent to outer space within SCP-6041-1 in hopes of opening the possibility of assisting space-related endeavors. JM-498 and JM-390 were tasked with following the strings of SCP-6041-1 via SCP-6041 and reporting what they saw. Begin log. Wow, we are very high on ground. The perspective is from JM-498 and JM-390's body cameras. SCP-6041 has entered the thermosphere in SCP-6041. It is night time, and a vast proportion of the countryside and suburban areas is visible. JM-390's whistles. This is the most fresh air I've gotten all day. What do you think? Really? JM-390 turns to JM-498, whom is closing his eyes and going to hand real tightly. JM-390 rolls his eyes. Uh, are we in outer space yet? No, why are you? I don't like heights, and I'm high up. Do I need to spell it out? It doesn't even look that bad. Knock it off, the view is pretty. I don't care if it's pretty. I'm not looking. I can barely make out the ground. I'm getting cold. And this lift doesn't look stable. This is terrifying, you know, and I'm not the only one. My parents wouldn't like this. My friends wouldn't like this. Even infants are afraid of heights. Scientifically proven. Look it up. I'm just... G okay, fine. Be scared we want to. Just quit whining. The sooner we see stars, the sooner we get this over. So... JM-498 snows as he takes a deep breath and tilts his head up. JM-390 continues to look down from the platform. JM-498 opens his eyes and emits a sudden gasp. Stop the lift! Dude, if the height thing is bothering you that much, then just... just look up or whatever. I am! 
JM390, let's be confused, turns to follow JM498's gaze. The atmosphere above them has been spontaneously replaced by a ceiling, painted to have the appearance of a starry night sky. JM390 silently curses as SCP-6041 is quickly approaching the ceiling. Stop the lift! JM390 rushes to the controls and tries to pull on the lever. The lever is stuck. The ceiling is only a meter away from SCP-6041. Stop the lift! I'm trying! It's stuck! Try harder! We're almost gonna... Oh, crap! JM-498 and JM-390 jump to the floor and press themselves close to the ground. SCP-6041 makes contact with the ceiling. The sound of glass breaking is audible, a shot fall on the platform in both personnel. JM-390 and JM-498 both grab for the lever and pull on it. Their combined strength frees the lever and SCP-6041 ceases ascending. The scenery past the ceiling shows the background as a multitude of black blankets covered in shiny glitter. Mars is visible and is represented by a large foam ball painted in red. Wow! This... actually... this isn't that bad. It's pretty. Beautiful even. <laughs> okay, we've seen outer space. I think we can go back now. Huh? What? JM-390 doesn't respond to JM-498 and is looking below the platform, his mouth agape. JM-498 hesitantly approaches the hand railing and leans over. A massive hole is situated where SCP-6041 has emerged. JM-498 crouches and inspects one of the shards, a piece of glass painted dark purple on one side. JM-390 silently curses to himself. Oh, yeah, that's gonna be a problem, isn't it? End log. Unfortunately, the equivalent of the sky in SCP-6041-1 became damaged in the process, causing our own to be Come affected. A section of the thermosphere and exosphere spontaneously disappeared, leaving a massive hole in the atmosphere 20 kilometers above ground, hereby designated SCP 6041A. Several anomalous objects were found near the bottom of SCP 6041, resembling thin gas like shards that visually resembled the sky when observed from above. These shards were intangible in our dimension, but not in SCP-6041-1. As such, it was possible to collect them. While outer space can be seen within SCP-6041-A, no ear suction has been present around the anomaly and caused no detrimental effects to the surrounding atmosphere. Since SCP-6041-A was visible from the ground, containment procedures have been updated to conceal the anomaly through the use of an AHP, anti holographic projector, a large experimental device capable of imbuing a target with anti properties through the use of non-ionizing radiation and thaumaturgy. Attached to a Foundation satellite, all future tests and proposals involving SCP-6041 were postponed until the issue of SCP-6041-A has been resolved. Addendum 3. Escalation Twelve days after the manifestation of SCP-6041-A, it was found that the anomaly was slowly growing in size. This corresponded with the hole inside SCP-6041-1, the hole was cracking further, and pieces of the ceiling were breaking off. Of great concern was the fact that even through the damage to SCP-6041-A would not result in the destruction of the atmosphere. It could cause a BK-class broken masquerade scenario if not rectified. Emergency protocols were activated, and significant resources were dedicated to containment, and if possible, complete termination of SCP-6041-A. In addition to being a spatial and dimensional anomaly, further analysis proved SCP-6041 was also 
an ontokinetic anomaly as it was found to emit low levels of fumes. Lead researcher Jennings submitted a proposal. A flying drone with an attached scrambling reality anchor would approach the anomaly, with two others capable of directed thaumaturgical intervention following to assist. It was theorized that if SRAs are to be deployed near SCP-6041-A, it would dissipate or at least be negated. Contrary to expectations, the growth rate of SCP-6041-A increased exponentially. Lead researcher Jennings was demoted, and a new position was taken by Dr. Barnes. SCP-6041-A eventually reached a radius of 150 meters, and the AAP had extreme difficulty covering the anomaly. Reports emerged of the appearance of more shards in nearby towns. MPF-1243, Home Invaders, was deployed to retrieve the shards and to anesthetize all witnesses. While the shards were recovered, MTF Role 43 failed to 40% the information from leaking across civilian populations. This necessitated the production of Chicken Little 2, The World's Gone Nuts, the live-action sequel to the 2005 film Chicken Little. The narrative details the sky actually falling due to the actions of a hostile alien empire. Chicken Little, played by actor Andrew Lincoln, is tasked to not only repair the sky, but to save the galaxy from plunging into civil war with the help of his friends. By the Foundation Front Company Secret Cut Productions as a cover story after purchasing the rights from the Walt Disney Company. Lead researcher Barnes drafted another proposal involving retrieving the shards and reattaching them to the hole in SCP-6041-1. A large amount of shards were recovered. The damage to the ceiling was reversed when the edges of the hole and shards were pressed against each other, allowing the fissure to disappear. This reduced SCP-6041-A size to 105 meters, but did not stop its rate of growth. If allowed to continue, it would soon return to its former size. The area was intensively searched for the remaining shards, but none were located. With the process of the resource drain of SCP-6041-A being unacceptable, lead researcher Barnes sought a more viable solution. Since the main shards were missing, he drafted the final proposal which involved creating a substitute for the empty spaces in the hole. A massive sheet of paper measuring 120 meters in perimeter was constructed and painted mostly cyan with large blotches of white on it. Personnel were able to prop the sheet up into SCP-6041-1 with great difficulty and were able to cover the hole with it through the use of 19 rolls of duct tape. The threat posed by SCP-6041-A was neutralized and expansion ceased. However, SCP-6041-A was replaced by the sheet and demonstrates the same anomalous properties as the shards. Because of this, the AHP had to remain active. Chicken Little 2, The World's Gone Nut, performed extremely badly at the box office. Critics scrutinized the film on the grounds of poor use of CGI, the plot being nonsensical and having its rating changed to R compared to the previous installment. Furthermore, the very committee also viciously condemned the movie for replacing the anthropomorphic animal characters with humans for no apparent reason. The director in charge of the production was fired, and Secret Cat Productions went bankrupt. Although containment required extensive resources, Neat Researcher Barnes was pleased with the results, citing that he and his team were able to neutralize SCP-6041-A and its prior form. He took credit for the one to prevent the PK-class scenario from occurring. Adelum 4 Broken Masquerade Scenario on the day lead researcher Barnes scheduled for a celebration of his staff's successful neutralization of SCP-6041-A, the North Korean incident occurred, leading to an immediate BK class scenario and the lifting of the veil. Lead researcher Barnes cancelled the celebration.
Item number SCP-6150, Security Level 2. Containment Class, Safe. Disruption Class, Not Applicable. Risk Class, Danger. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-6115-1 individuals are to be transferred to the nearest Foundation facility with medical equipment capable of treating SCP-6115. Per Foundation medical policy, patients must receive a clean bill of health or sign a waiver before being released. MDF Alpha 4 Pony Express is to destroy any instances of SCP-6115 found in the mail. Description SCP-6115 refers to a blue-green gel-like substance. Typically, it is kept within a 4 cm by 1.5 cm by 12 cm cylindrical plastic container, which is held in paper packages. The anomaly is a thermogenically active substance with a number of effects on living tissue. SCP-6115-1 instances are humans who had made skin contact with the anomaly. Upon initial contact with SCP-6115, a thaumaturgic sympathy bond forms, causing the body's energy processing and distribution mechanism to form an alternate organ system. Safely dispelling this bond is crucial to successful neutralization. After full implementation of these changes, the body is able to ectoentropically maintain itself near indefinitely, using an anomalous process known as self lamosis While in this state, the individual is able to produce energy on demand to power bodily organs, though efficiency is typically too poor to allow motor function. This system does not utilize traditional boundaries between organs and bodily tissue, instead opting for an internal circuitry system within the confines of the body composed almost entirely of pharmaceutic medium fluids. There are several conviction cycles within the SCP-6115-1 instance's body which serve various purposes, such as ritual energy generation, repurposing waste, transmitting signals from the brain, and production of additional fluid. This extraneous production must be flushed from the system to prevent necrosis. In the early stages, this manifests through suffusion of fluid through pores in the skin because the ratio of SCP-6115 bio to mundane bodily fluids is low. Most vented output is composed of the latter. Due to the cycle formations being undeveloped early, distribution is poor, and parts of the individual's skin bulges as fluid collects in various parts of the body. During this stage, the following symptoms are commonly reported. Excessive bleeding, nausea and vomiting, toxic shock syndrome, skin inflammation, citrus Consolidus, merging of internal organs, hyperdontia, usually due to dissolution of gum tissue, headache, due to the significant induced emesis. The SCP-6115 pathet notes that the generated anomalous fluids were specially designed to handle this output. Indeed, any form melt with the skin informs large moss-like scabs after several minutes of contact. One concern per physicians should consider when treating SCP-6115-1 patients is the onset of thaumaturgic hypermaterialization. This is a consequence of SCP-6115's design. The presence of excess catalyst polyps in the original anomalous substance can stimulate excessive cell division. Due to the lack of custom summoning frame, these tumorous growths extrude from any extremity they can, commonly targeting fingers, toes, eyes, nasal holes, and the tongue. These protrusions can grow significantly beyond normal bodily boundaries. The largest recorded incident was 0.41 meters of a fleshy appendage attached 
to the subject's left thumb, which can cause discomfort in the host. It is at this point that the SCP-6115 pamphlet recommends calling the Foundation to a point of contact with the anomaly. In stage, SCP-6115 is marked by the affected individual having a fully flexible form with internal thomic cycles replacing traditionally shaped organs and tissues. Because few civilians have training in anomalous self-image projection, mobility in this state is extremely difficult, and their body tends to take the shape of whatever container it is in. It is for this reason that most instances are found residing in the bathtub when Foundation medical personnel arrive. Continuous vomiting also ceases around this time due to the lack of, of a traditional mouth. Despite severe symptoms, SCP-6115 is not usually fatal. Only 2.7% of infectees expire, usually as a result of medical complications from old age. Use of rectal thaumaturgic sunworm therapy in combination with blood warding has proven effective in healing affected individuals. Nearly all recovered individuals regrow lost organs and return to normal health within a month. Addendum 6115-1 Obligations under U.S. Law In 2023, the American Peril Health Provider Act was passed by the U.S. Congress and signed into law by the President. Written and sponsored by a Senator from Vermont, the Act requires the Foundation, as a condition of its funding from the U.S. government, to provide medical care to all otherwise non-anonymous U.S. citizens and permanent residents who are experimenting negative health effects from interaction with anomalies. Most SCP-6115 instances are acquired via ASH, an online marketplace that sells anomalous goods. It is a subsidiary of Marshall, Carter and & Dark and is marketed towards low- and middle-income civilians. Where they are sold for $20 each, plus shipping and handling, because the Foundation has the technological capability to heal SCP-6151 instances, this law enforces a broad obligation to provide care for such civilians. Since 2025, the Foundation has received more than 170,000 patients annually who intentionally self-administered SCP-6115 because they had a serious non-anomalous malady and could not afford health insurance.